with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Ontario's New Democrats are about to have a new leader. She is Marit Stiles, and tonight we'll find out what her priorities will be as leader of the official opposition and what kind of New Democrat she really is. Then we'll look into what's driving an increase in violence and disruption in Ontario schools and what can be done about it. It's Thursday, December 15th, and that's tonight on The Agenda. Party leadership contests often kick up a lot of dust, test the campaign chops of candidates, and offer an opportunity for lots of attention and signing up new members. None of that happened in this year's race for the leadership of the Ontario New Democrats, a job which incidentally also means becoming leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition at Queen's Park. Only one person stepped forward, and so, uncontested, Marat Stiles effectively won the job before a vote was even held. She is the member of provincial parliament for Davenport in downtown Toronto, and she joins us now. Congratulations, first of all. Thank you very much. Just the way you figured it would unfold? No. <laughs> no, it isn't. I, I for sure thought we'd be in the race till March, which is when the vote was supposed to take place. So, uh, yeah, a little bit of a surprise, but I, I'm willing to roll with this. Yep. <laughs> right on. We'll come back uh, to this more later. I want to start with... Uh, a very heavy-hitting question, if we can, right off the top. Mm -hmm. You're from Newfoundland. Yes. Where's your accent? Ah, well, I've been gone for 30 years. But still. I am told, well, and, I, and I'm told that my accent comes back after a few beer and when I'm back in Newfoundland by my daughters, who swear it does. But I don't think I ever had a really strong accent. I grew up in St. John's and, I mean, outside of St. John's, but I essentially went to school in St. John's, so I don't think I ever had a super strong accent. But when I do listen to recordings, yeah, it's there. <laughs> <laughs> does, does being from that part of the country, in other words, you weren't born and raised in downtown Toronto, no. does that make you a different kind of leader of the New Democrats of Ontario? I, I think it it does. I definitely, I mean, I am an Ontarian, right? I, I've lived here for 30 years. I'm proud of it. But I, I do think it helps me to understand other places and that Ontario isn't just about, you know, big cities like Toronto. I think it helps me understand the impact of a province where the resource industry is like at the forefront uh, and what that means and what it's like to see communities that you, you've grown up in die, which we certainly saw. I think it does make me a little different. And I mean, I, I do think also that uh, Newfoundlanders, we, we do have a good sense of humor about things. I'm able to laugh a lot of stuff off. Hmm. All right, you're going to forgive a bunch of inevitable questions which you know are coming, but yeah. let, let's start with this. I mean, you're replacing somebody in Andrea Horvath who, you know, is of Southern Ontario, born and raised in Hamilton, lived here yeah. from all we can see much of her life. Uh, I guess people want to know off the top how you intend to lead differently than she did. And she was there for a long time, right? I mean, four election campaigns, 13 years, et cetera. What do you think? Well, uh, first of all, I mean, obviously, I'm very grateful, as we all are, I think, to Andrea for her achievements. We are official opposition. We still have a strong caucus um, and a very diverse caucus. Um, and that's due to her hard work. There's no question. Uh, I do think I have a different style of leadership. And uh, one of the things that I think you can expect from me is uh, is a lot of work at the grassroots, um, connecting in communities. Uh, I think also, and, and what I'm finding is as we tour the province, that a lot of people are coming out that have never supported the NDP before. Uh, I think I connect with those folks. I think they're they're interested. They're certainly curious, and they're coming away saying that they're they're excited about something else. So I think I have an opportunity here to to build and to reach into new areas where, we're, frankly, we're going to have to because I intend to win the next election. Okay, more on that in a bit because mm. that's not something most New Democrat leaders over the years that I've covered Queens Park actually say or believe. Mm. You really believe it? Absolutely, 100%. Let's try to find out what kind of leader of the NDP you are. And by that I mean, I mean, I go back far enough to remember when Stephen Lewis was leader of the NDP, right. and he was a self-acknowledged, you know, pure ideologue who had no pretensions ever of becoming Premier of Ontario. And you go from that part of the continuum all the way to, say, somebody like Gary Dewar, mm -hmm. who I think might have been very happy, the former Premier of Manitoba, might have been very happy being, you know, he would have felt at home in some progressive conservative parties in mm -hmm. Ontario history. Bill Davis's PC party, for sure. Where are you on that line? Mm -hmm. Well, I've, I've been a New Democrat for 
pretty much the whole time I've been in Ontario for sort of about 30 years. Um, I believe very strongly in the, princi the principles of social democracy. I am, uh, I, I've worked very hard on the policies. I thought I've also been an activist in my community. Um, I, I think that what makes me, what inspires me are bold ideas. You know, uh, and I do believe in that sort of those NDP principles and values. And I, what I think is exciting right now, actually, and why I think I can say very confidently that I'm I'm in it to win, mm. is because I think that those values and principles and ideas connect with a lot of people right now. There's a lot of people who are who are looking for that kind of vision for this province and hope, and they've been told for so long that this is as good as it gets. Uh, I think they feel like they've been taken for granted. I think it's one of the reasons why voter turnout has been so sadly low. And and so I feel very proud of those principles. I mean, I'm I'm excited. Like, I love talking to people like Stephen Lewis about the history of our party. and um, But I'm also excited about new people who are coming into the party with new ideas. And, and um, But I think they need to be grounded in those strong social democratic principles. Well, one bold idea Stephen Lewis ran on was nationalizing INCO and a bank. I mean, are you, for, are, you, are you for that? You know, I, I do believe in um, a strong role for government, you know, and I, and I would love to see uh, us get back into the job of doing more like building of housing, for example. I mean, I think government has a very strong role to play. And I'm proud, too, of the, the times when the NDP stepped in to ensure that we saved major industry, right? Um, but I'm also a realist uh, in terms of what I think uh, is facing us right now. We have some major challenges in this province, and uh, I want to work with everybody to try to build this province up and create more jobs and more opportunities. But I'll tell you, one of my big focuses is for 100% going to be dealing with the health care and education crisis. Would you nationalize auto insurance in the province? <laughs> um, the NDP they, once stood for they, that. They did. And, you know, I, I'm a big, I'm actually a big supporter of, um, of some, in fact, we have a bill that we've put forward myself, Tom Rakosevic and myself, um, on auto insurance rates and ending the, uh, the discrimination. I, I do think a public auto insurance plan would have been the right way to go and definitely willing to reconsider it, yeah. Hmm. Uh, okay, let's deal with this head on. It's not your fault no one decided to run against you, <laughs> but it does deprive your party of all the, as we suggested in the intro, all the sis boom ba that a convention would have brought. How far behind the eight ball do you think that puts you in as much as you didn't get this big festival mm. so that people, well, sign up new members, get a lot of attention, et cetera, et cetera? Well, I've been running like it was that kind of race since September. So I've, we've been bringing that boom <laughs> uh, as you said, for the last few months. I mean, we've been going out across the province. Uh, I've been meeting people. We've held events. Um, and the party has tried to make it a little more exciting. But the truth is, in this moment anyways, in the kind of midst of a pandemic still, one would argue, uh, events are not like that anymore, right? So it is always a challenge right now, I think, for every party to get that kind of, you know, capacity at an event that, that generates a lot of excitement. Um, debates are important. I had no intention of ever debating myself. Mm. I was, you know, love to debate others. But but those conversations uh, did happen. There was excitement. There remains excitement. And I think what actually is, is really interesting in this moment is that we are very unified, right? Those kind of contests can be very divisive. Mm -hmm. We are unified uh, and we are very focused on the real race. So that was part of it, but now we are back to where the real focus should be, which is on defeating Doug Ford. No, not to beat a dead horse here, though, but when Pierre Polyev won the National Conservative Party yeah. leadership, you know, he won in a walk, as right. presumably you would have had other candidates been in the race. But there was something about the way he defeated, you know, mm -hmm. Jean Charest, Patrick mm -hmm. Brown, mm -hmm. and on and on, that really proved to the country and to conservatives, I guess he's our guy. Mm -hmm. You didn't get a chance to do that. Are you disappointed? Well, I can't speak to why others chose not to enter the race, but I do know that a lot of MPPs were looking at it, a lot of my colleagues. We have very strong, a very strong team, as you know, uh, very strong MPPs, many of them leaders themselves, leaders in their communities. And uh, But I can't speak for why they chose not to run, but I do think that it was a nod to the strength of our campaign as well, right, that we did... Uh, we were out there organizing. We were out there raising the money that we needed to raise and getting the signatures and building the membership and getting into every corner of the province. And I think it did send a really strong message uh, that we were going to be the campaign to beat. And 
in the end, like I said, I mean, I, I do feel like when people say to me, well, there was no race, I said, where were you? I, I, was, I was in it. We've been, we've been well, at it you, ever since. You yeah. won't say it, but I'll say it. You scared everybody off. I mean, you got into the race early. You had tons of support. You had the financial backing. You scared everybody off. Again, not your fault, but that's the way it turned out. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I, I definitely, um, again, can't really speak for my colleagues. Yeah. And, and lots of people have lots of reasons why they choose to do this or not. And for me, um, the stars were aligned, you know, mm. I, I, in my family life, in my, uh, my sense of my vision for what the province, for me, this is the right time. Uh, I got, I'm excited about it. I really believe this is an opportunity. And I also am really motivated um, by what I see happening in the province. And well, let I, me pick up on that, because yeah. I think one of the things, okay, this is me, I could be totally wrong, but here we go. I'm accustomed to seeing New Democrats losing seats to Liberals in election after election after election after election in this province. I don't ever remember them losing seven or eight seats in one election to Tories. And that's what happened back in June. Do you yet have a good understanding of why the New Democrats lost so many seats to Doug Ford's progressive conservatives? Um, well, that's a big question. I, I think some of those seats, a significant number of those seats were non-incumbents. They were seats where we didn't have an incumbent running. That wasn't, and which is not an insignificant issue for, for anyone. Um, but I do think that the conservatives were very focused on, you know, trying to convince Ontarians, for example, that they represent working people. Uh, I think uh, there's a lot of uh, voter remorse out there right now. Um, both in terms of the quality of the candidates that were elected. I'll just say that. I, I'm noticing that when I go into those ridings. Um, but also uh, because the government sold them a bill of goods. <laughs> because, because they've broken all their promises already. Because they did not tell them they were going to trample on the charter rights of, uh, of unionized workers. Because they did not tell them they were going to be paving over farmlands and, and, uh, well, and they selling did say off wetlands. They ran on the 413. They ran on the Bradford Bypass. Not the Green Belt. Not and I do belt. think that's a huge issue. I mean, I'm hearing that from many corners of the province, not just, I mean, communities close to the Green Belt. And um, there is a real sense that something doesn't smell right in that deal, too, let's just say it. So, uh, but I, I think there's a, I think the, also that the, uh, the use of the notwithstanding clause, I mean, there, that united labor in a way that I haven't seen in many, many years. And it united Labour with the NDP, and that's not insignificant either. Well, okay, Michael Balagas, who's run campaigns for yes. the NDP both here and in Manitoba, and you know is a, a tremendous veteran in the party, mm -hmm. he has said, and this is his quote, the NDP have become fantastic at having an intellectual debate about class and redistribution of wealth, but it has come at the expense of being able to talk directly to working class vo voters about their lives and needs. And he added, the question is, can we advance a greater social justice agenda? Absolutely. Without us losing working class voters? Probably not. And it does raise the question whether the NDP has been so focused on equity issues, on social justice issues, that you've lost the blue collar vote. What do you think? I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I, I think that, um, I, but I would say, and and you know, Michael was at the helm for many of these years, um, that that we have perhaps not connected and prioritized um, that relationship with the labor movement. That we need, we, we, you know, it, there is a tendency, I think, has been to take that for granted that we are the party of labor but you you need to be talking to the people who are the who are in who are the labor labor uh, workers the unionized workers and um, and working people and I intend to prioritize that absolutely so the party might have taken its eye off that ball I, I think that it was I don't think it's been intentional we have I should say you know many of our MPPs our caucus members um, who work you know so hard every day um, you know connecting with labor on those issues Issues. Um, Wayne Gates, Jamie West, uh, Guy Bourguin, all, you know, these folks are doing the work, really hard work. Um, so it's there, but I think it needs to come from the top as well. Well, Labour Minister Monty McNaughton of the current government said the NDP was more concerned about statues and street names than they were about good jobs. Now, I get he's a partisan, and I get, you know... And also, what a terrible thing to say, though. Like, th that really is dismissive of all the people who, in this province, particularly Indigenous people, who have important reasons. So this is a good example of how this government says one thing one day and then another thing the other. 
um, you know, I, I think there's a lot more people that understand when you stop to think about why people raise concerns about things like statues and street names, it may seem like uh, not a big deal, but when you think about why, why those, those, those names mean so much and, and are so hurtful, I, I mean, I think it's very dismissive of the minister to, to put it like that. D okay, I hear you, but at some level, he's speaking to something that obviously resonated with enough people that it enabled his party to take seven or eight seats away from you guys in the last election. And it does, I mean, it just, it basically but raises the same issue. it's divisive politics, isn't it, though? It's the same thing that Pauly Ever's playing at. It's a politics of division. It's a politics of hate. That's, that's something that I actually find irresponsible of political leaders. I would expect better from a minister. I, I think that, you know, it's our responsibility as political leaders to bring people together, to help people understand each other better. Um, I don't think that these things are mutually exclusive. I, I, I know lots of people who are, um, you know, working people who are also indigenous people. <laughs> you know, it's like this is the other piece of this. And, and, and I think that um, what the conservatives do, their approach to politics is to divide people. And that's a really good example of it, um, what the minister said. One of the traps I think New Democrats have fallen into over the years is that because you've only governed once, right, 1990 to 95. In Ontario. Only, in Ontario. Great point. In Ontario. <laughs> Um, you have often been able to be typecast by your political opponents as sort of sanctimonious downtown Toronto white wine sipping lefties out of touch with reality. That's the stereotype. How do you get out of that box? Well, I mean, first of all, I would say look at our caucus, right? We are a caucus of lots of, you know, there's a lot of diversity there of backgrounds and cultures and communities, and we represent uh, ridings in every corner of this province. Um, I do think that, uh, you know, we always have work to do, but I mean, I think that um, what we need to do is be out there connecting with more and more people. You know, I, I, for me, it's all about the organizing that we do in the communities and on the ground. And I do think, you know, there are communities that have never considered supporting the NDP because they don't know they don't know how that relates to them. I think about like I went to Newmarket for their Pride Parade last summer. A riding you've never won. Yeah, exactly. And there was a great little NDP contingent. It wasn't quite as big as the Conservative contingent, but it was the the uh, excitement and the connections. Uh, the there's something happening there and i think we just need to not take we we need to assume that every every riding is an opportunity for us that there are people who are looking for an alternative and all you have to do is see what ford and the conservative government are doing in communities across this province to see how people are losing hope and we need to remind them and inspire them to believe that things can be different and and give them some solutions he is letting a lot of people down and communities like Newmarket, that's one of them. There's a lot of people there right now, a lot of conservatives disappointed in this government. Do you think the provincial liberals are a spent force? You know, I, I think they have some significant, um, uh, they have a lot to do, a lot of work to do to, uh, and, and, but to be honest, for me and our, in our party right now, that's not my, that's not, what I'm looking at. I'm focused on... No, no, but the voters on, are. Because the vote, yeah. if the voters want an alternative to these guys, they're looking at you, they're going to look at whoever ends up leading yeah. that party, and you've never, your party has never in Ontario history come second twice in a row. And you have now. So, is this, uh, is this a new permanent state of Ontario political affairs? It may very well be. Um, again, I can't speak for the Liberals, but I do think that uh, what I'm finding increasingly is that people are coming to us looking for that progressive alternative that they're not seeing in the Liberal Party. And, uh, and I think they're seeing the strength as well of our, of our movement, of our caucus. Uh, and I, I think we can, we can bring them in. I mean, I do think we are, we, we are an umbrella and we need to bring people in from lots of different backgrounds and, and political leanings. And there are a lot of red Tories, you know, we used to always talk about red Tories, uh, a lot of progressive conservatives who are very unhappy with this government. There are a lot of liberals who are very unhappy with their own party. Um, I, they may come to us, but my focus right now is, is in, you know, pushing the government back in their, their, the worst parts of their agenda. Uh, and we've had some success there in the last few months, for sure. Um, and building those connections with 
movements that are organizing against the government. I mean, this is crucial. Is the federal leader, who used to be a member of your caucus yes. at Queen's Park, Jagmeet Singh, is he a help or a hindrance to your efforts? Oh, I mean, Jagmeet is, a, is, a, is wonderful. I met with Jagmeet just this weekend in Brampton. Uh, I think he has connected with a lot of also new communities across this province. But the, the opportunity we have here right now is the provincial NDP fighting the conservatives and building something that we can get excited about. And I mean, the, I, I'm always a fan of, we also have some really strong uh, NDP MPs here, and I hope we can make more inroads in the next federal election. Your party is 60 years old, and I wonder, this is one of these sort of airy-fairy academic questions, but I wonder whether you think its most important moments over the course of those years mm -hmm. were the five years it spent in power or the 55 years it spent in opposition, <laughs> trying in many cases to have a positive influence on power. It's hard to be in opposition. Um, we're good at it. We know how to do this. But I will say, uh, you know, I worked my first job out of university uh, in, in Ontario was, was working in the NDP government. I worked uh, for an MPP named Gilles Bisson. Timmins. From Timmins. And, uh, and so I worked on a lot of northern issues. And I remember those days. I mean, I was a very junior assistant, but I'm really proud of what we achieved in government. And, and a lot of what we achieved has stuck, which is really interesting, right? Midwifery, nurse practitioners, Cancer Care Ontario, the Environmental Bill of Rights. Uh, we built a lot of housing. Um, I, I'm really proud of all of that. Jobs Ontario, training programs. But, you know, and it's taken, in, in the 30 years since then, every government has tried to strip away what we achieved, little bit by bit, but there's some things that have stuck. And I have ever since then thought, you know, this is what we need to do. We can, we can, we can prevent a lot of damage and we can hopefully put forward solutions and work with other levels of, or other parties uh, when we're in opposition. But if we're really going to make the change that needs to happen in this province, if we're going to stop the crisis in healthcare, we have to have an opportunity to be in government so we can do it. There are solutions and people need to know that and we need to inspire them to believe that we can make it happen. Well, hopefully this will be the first of many visits to our studio yes. over the ensuing years that you have this job. That's Marit Stiles. She's the incoming leader of the Ontario NDP. Thanks for joining Thank us you. here on TV. Thanks so much. When Ontario students return to their classrooms after all the disruption of COVID, the safety everyone was concerned about was related to the ongoing pandemic. But as a walkout by students at one Toronto high school recently made clear, violence inside those schools and on the nearby streets is now also a real concern. And it goes well beyond the capital city. Tia Ryan Mathias is a grade 11 student at York Memorial Collegiate Institute, where that protest took place. And she's going to join us now and tell us a little bit about what's going on. Thank Tia, you. thanks for coming in. We're really grateful. Thank you, Steve. Well, talk about this, the violence and the destruction that you are seeing at your school. Describe it for us, if you would. Um, the violence at Memo is clearly chaotic. There's so much things happening, and so much disruption that each and every one of us encounters every single day. There's not much we can really do about it, but just hope that it goes away or we won't be a part of it or see it. Describe it for me though, Tia, what kind of stuff's going on? Fights happening, teachers are just constantly getting picked at by students. Um, Where does it happen? Classrooms, halls, the hallways most majority of the times or sometimes in the bathrooms. Students are fighting in the bathrooms? Yes. Fist fights? Yes, brawls are happening. Sometimes they would lock the bathroom because fights would occur in them. So that way the staff can't get in to break it up? Yeah. People getting badly hurt? Um, I'm not too sure about that, hmm. uh, but it seems like from the videos, they, they get hurt. Oh, this is a new thing from, from your day as opposed to my day. <laughs> you, you guys actually video these fights, right? Yes. And then you put them up on what, TikTok or something? People would put them on social media or they would just share it amongst their, their friends. Hmm. Um, I presume it's kind of scary going to school these days. Is that fair to say? Yes, very, very much. Yeah. There, you really don't know if you might be a part of it or if you stare at these students, will they, will they say, oh, 
why are you looking at me? Or do you want to fight? It's just, you got to keep, keep your head down and just pray that you don't get caught in the fights. And so far you have not, I guess. No, 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 no. No, you like to keep your distance. Yes, I like to keep my distance. Gotcha. Is it always students from your school or are there other schools that send students over as well or what? Mm, not most of the time it really happens, but there have been times where other schools came to our school and they would just fight and sometimes it wouldn't really involve memo students. But there was this one time a fight happened from a different school happened at our school. So it was just a bit complicated there. Tia, is it always just fists? You know what I'm saying here? Like, yes. are guys bringing knives to these fights or stuff? They would threat, bring threats saying that they will. Um, I'm not sure if this was related to what happened before, but we had a lockdown and students said they were bringing a gun and we were on lockdown for an hour and 30 minutes, I believe so. But the police didn't find no weapon on the students, so we were allowed to leave. But for now, there hasn't been that much weapons or anything involved in fights that I know of. How worried are you that as this escalates, students are going to start bringing knives and guns and other weapons? Very worried because I don't know and sometimes I don't have classes, my teachers are not here, and there's no supply teachers. So we would have to relocate into the CAF or the library, and sometimes I or my friends, we don't want to go to the CAF because it's, it's nobody's there and there's, not, there's nothing you can do. And the library is packed with other students that don't have no classes as well. So I'm afraid that, that lockdowns might happen while I'm in the halls and I might not be able to find a class that has a teacher in it. I presume you want to go to school to learn stuff. Of course, yes. And I also presume that it's pretty hard to learn when you're in fear. Is that also fair to say? Yeah, you lose a lot of motivation to do your work. Well, for me, I've lost so much motivation to do my own work, which is building up on me and taking a toll on me as well, so. How so, what kind of toll? Stress. Uh. <laughs> uh, plus, culminating are happening, summatives are happening, and I haven't done much of my assignments. I'll translate there because I never, we, we never had these words when I went to school. But summatives, I've learned this from my kids, summatives are, you know, these are assignments and so on that you've got to get in. And it's hard to, it's hard to get them in when you can't learn. True, yes. Okay. I want to know if you blame anybody for the way things are. I blame both the TDSB and the students. TDSB for not listening to both Harvey's and Memo students. For not listening to what? To Harvey and Memo students. Our parents, just the community in general. And the students for just not adapting to the change and just being selfish about everything. We all have our own differences which is understandable, but we're all in this together. And if, we, if one person suffers, then the whole entire school suffers. And we just need to learn our differences and come together and put everything aside to be one school and not be rivals. We should just explain for people who live outside Toronto, your school actually is the amalgamation of a couple of schools, right? Yes. So you, you've got a lot of people in that school you never knew from, because yeah. they were at another school. So you gotta find a way to come together. Yeah, when I was at Scarlet, well, when Memo was at Scarlet, we didn't know each other, but we knew each other. So that feeling where we were family was there, but now coming to this school, it's very off. Right. You don't feel welcomed, you don't feel safe. You just, or this aura around, it just feels dark. Let me ask you one last thing. Would you feel safer if there was a police presence in your schools all the time? Yes, 100%. Um, the police just being there or being outside, just making sure that students are safe would make me feel a lot better than just being outside, probably talking to my friends if something might happen and there's nothing for me to do or, or it's nothing that I can do. Hmm. 
Tia, I'm going to continue the conversation with some folks on the other side of the studio, but I really want to thank you for coming in and sharing your views about this, because I think you've given us a lot to think about. You've, you've experienced it, so we're really happy to get your views on this. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, let's get a wider view of how common such situations are and what can be done about them, starting in Wakefield, Quebec, with Chris Brucker. Professor at the University of Ottawa in the Criminology Department. She's written two recent reports on violence in Ontario schools. In Port Hope, Ontario, Wendy Goods, a retired elementary school teacher. And here in our studio, Anna Sideropoulos, parent of two students at Birchmount Park Collegiate Institute, where she sits on the parent council. Tesfai Mengesha, executive director of operations at Success Beyond Limits, that's a youth-led, community-based group that provides academic and social supports to Toronto youth. And Eitan Laufer, a high school teacher currently seconded as an occupational health and safety inspector for OSSTF. That's the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation. And we're grateful to have you three here in our studio and our two guests in Points Beyond to join us for, oh my gosh, what a timely and important discussion. Eitan, to you first. We just heard what Tia said. Give us the broader view. What kind of violence are we seeing in schools today? Yeah, I, th I think we're seeing quite a wide spectrum of violence uh, occurring both amongst students and towards staff uh, throughout TDSB schools. And I think we're seeing physical violence, assaults. I think we're seeing verbal threats of violence. Uh, and I think we're seeing uh, the grouping of students to be used as kind of an intimidation and harassment tactic. And I think something that's really important and interesting to note at this time is if we compare the first three months of last school year to the first three months of this school year, the incidence of workplace violence that are reported has gone up over 40%. And so we can see that there's a really wide spectrum of violence occurring, and we can see that it's increasing uh, quite rapidly. Yeah, I don't want to minimize this, but that kind of makes sense in respect. I mean, they weren't in class a year ago, right? So th that's not surprising. No, not at all. And I think it's, it's one of those multi-layered challenges that we're experiencing both at the local school level and across the school board. Uh, and I think our response need to be, needs to be multi-layered as well. Okay, we'll get into that as we go along here. Chris, I, I know there's always a temptation outside the capital of the city to say, well, that's a Toronto problem, but it's only a Toronto problem. I guess you're here tonight to tell us it's not only a Toronto problem? It's not a Toronto problem. It's a school problem. It's not only a high school problem. It's an elementary school problem. This is... You know, to hear that it's gone up 40% is, is really disturbing. It also has to be taken into consideration that the rates were already really high. When we did research, we got rates of, you know, 70% of EAs experience an act of violence in a single school year. So a 40% increase is truly alarming because we're starting at a really high rate already. Hmm. Wendy, I know you're retired now, but did you see this kind of violence when you were teaching? Oh, most definitely. Um, and small rural community, it happens in every classroom. Um, I had a colleague last night share with me that a kindergarten student at his wife's school held another student up against the wall and punched her in the face so hard that her lip split. Now, this is a, a male student doing it to a female student? I'm not sure of the gender, um, but it was two kindergarten children. So Oof. senior kindergarten children. So it happens at all ages and happens frequently and on a daily basis. Did you ever fe face violence in your 40 years of teaching yourself, you personally? Oh, um, on a regular basis. I have a passion for working with uh, special needs children that are behaviorally challenged. Um, I had a student at one point um, come up to me and his fist came this far from my chin with deadpan eyes and said to me, I'm going to kill you. Not long after that, his mother's arm was broken. Uh, what, uh, what did you do when you found yourself in that situation? Um, I was very calm. I was acting principal that day, so I wasn't in my classroom, but things happened in my classroom on a regular basis. I had a quote unquote regular class um, with five students that had safety plans in it. Um, safety plans are created when children are, um, can possibly endanger other children. 
we frequently had desks being overturned, shelves emptied, any piece of furniture not affixed to something overturned. Um, it's a regular occurrence everywhere in the province. Yeah, let the record show. You're, you're almost two hours outside Toronto, so this is not just a Toronto thing. Um, okay, Anna, here's a tough question. You, you've had multiple stabbings at your kid's school. And I want to know what it's like as a parent to send your kids off to school every morning knowing that. It, Steve, it's um, really scary. And first of all, thank you for having uh, me here. It's, it's nice to have an opportunity for, as a parent to speak and um, talk, but it, it's really, really scary. You fear um, for them every day they go out the door? <sighs> Um, I believe that it was targeted. However, you know, never know if your child's going to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Right. You know, there, you know, I mean, the older one is desensitized. He said, oh, mom, this is normal. And that in itself is scary. How is that normal? You know, it's the second mm -hmm. time it's happened in seven months. The younger one, you know, he's trying to be brave, but, you know, he wants to move. He's like, can we move out of here? I said the, I said the same thing. The problem is everywhere. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not just here. So, yeah, it's, it's really terrifying. And especially wondering what's going on. Why? Are we having a second stabbing? What did we not do the first time, you know, to ensure that this wouldn't happen again? That's a great question. Can you answer that question? Why you is know, this happening so much? I don't know. I'm wondering why the cameras are still not fixed at our school, why they're sitting there collecting dust um, and not being installed. I'm wondering why, you know, we're not talking to the school council, while, why we're not having our chance to meet with the board and, you know, um, I don't know why the safety audit hasn't been done yet. I mean, the stabbing, the second stabbing was a month ago and we have yet to have a safety audit at our school. What do you think is going on here? I mean, I think I'd want to broaden the conversation a little bit in thinking about like schools are a part of communities. And so as we see violence increase across the city of Toronto and communities, we're also seeing similarities in schools. And that is represented also in the TDSB safety report that was presented last week. And so um, it's really important to look at communities more broadly. If we have healthy, vibrant, livable communities that have affordable housing, um, a meaningful employment and a livable wage, accessible transportation, uh, access to nutritious foods, I think we'll have healthier communities and it could address some of the issues that we're here discussing uh, with regards to violence that are manifesting themselves in schools. I have no doubt but that you're right, Tesfaye. Mm. But what you've just described, that agenda, will take 10 years to achieve if we, if we ever achieve it. Mm. She needs some answers today. Right. Um, how much of this do you think is happening because... You know, everybody went a little bit uh, bonkers during COVID and we were all locked down and then, you know, people weren't going to school and now they're back in school and, you know, we don't quite know how to react to it all. Yeah, I think there was an adjustment period. Um, at the beginning of COVID, I think everybody was adjusting, teachers, students were understanding what it meant to be uh, doing school virtually. And I think there's also an adjustment period to be back in school as well. Specifically, even for students that are going to high school uh, this year for the first time, but they were high school students for two, two years. So um, I think there's an adjustment period for everyone. And I think that's what we're seeing right now, especially you know, young people are, are, you know, are young growing up and they're socially developing. And a part of that social development uh, looked very differently when we were in a virtual space mm -hmm. versus being in school, interacting face to face with, with young people as well, too. So I think that's a part of the challenge as well. OK, Eitan, can I get you to pick up on that? How much of this is we're still trying to figure out after isolation from COVID? I, I yeah, I think, I, you know, to Chris's point about this being kind of a wider spread problem that's been going on for years, I, I do think that this is something that's been pervasive in schools uh, as long as I've been in the school board and as long as I've been part of education. And so I think the way in which COVID is exacerbating it is some of those, uh, as he spoke to, the socialization pieces, which are really challenging when kids are transitioning between one grade level and another. But something else that I think is happening uh, that's part of this wider conversation is that we don't quite have the resources in schools to deal with those challenges head on on a day to day basis. Resources like what? Whether it's social workers who, can, who students can reach out to, whether it's not for profit organizations that are embedded into school communities, which have a direct tie in to what students are experiencing in their community. And we don't quite have the ratio of student to teacher that would make those environments really productive in which teachers can put a little more time and a little more energy into those individual student relationships that make such a difference in the day to day experience. And so, uh, you know, I don't think the school board would argue that we're in desperate need of more resources, more funding to meet the needs and that resource need gap 
that's occurring throughout the school board is one of the significant factors, I think, that's contributing to such an escalation in violence. Okay, Chris, I want to come back to you, and I'd like you to react, if you would, to something Anna just said a moment ago, where she was mentioning that one of her children said, it's kind of normal. Violence has sort of been normalized in school. Um, what are we to take from that? Yeah, I think we're taking from that that we're seeing a very disturbing normalization of this, where teachers are routinely told that this is part of the job. EAs are told it's part of the job. Um, so, so I think this is really concerning because we have a whole generation of children growing up seeing this and seeing it normalized. And I think as a result of that, one of the things that happens is kids aren't even telling their parents. So, you know, kids are going home. It, it's so mundane. Of course we have evacuations. Of course, you know, the teacher was threatened that they're not even going home and telling their parents. So I'm not even sure parents are aware of, of the extent of violence in schools. Wow. Well, and, and, and that's... I want to get in on that. Are you worried that your kids are only telling you half the story? Um, I think that that does happen. When we had our school council meeting last week, we found out of a new thing that's going on now where kids are airdropping things to each other, you know, walking up to windows and airdropping things to people's phones. And I'm, I hadn't heard about that. My kids hadn't told me. Sorry, what does that mean? Airdropping. So if you have an iPhone. Oh, the, um, no, I know I, what you, airdropping oh, is. Oh, so if they... I had an image or something that okay. I want to scare you with or something inappropriate, I would airdrop you uh. and it would just show up on your screen and, you know, you'd be scared or traumatized. So this is the new thing that's happening. I didn't know. It had a principal not told us. My, you know, my boys were fortunate enough that it was just something maybe funny that came to them, but it could be something really scary. Wendy, one of the things you've talked about in the past is that you've, you've started to see, or you did start to see, a lot of kids come to school with quote-unquote baggage. What kind of baggage are you referring to there? Um, many, of, many kids come to school and they have had a rough start to the day. There were fights in the <clears throat> household um, the night before. There were um, parents worried because one of the, their older siblings had disappeared somewhere. Um, lack of self-regulation skills. Um, they don't know. And like some of the other panelists have said, the normalization of um, the violence that happens in the classroom and um, the trauma that that has on every student in the class. And it's a big one. Um, Teachers and support staff workers are often blamed for um, a student acting out. An ad administrator will say, well, what did you do to cause that? Hmm. That's not helping the child. And their needs just aren't being met. Well, let me follow up with Tesfai on that. Because uh, I guess, it, you know, if a kid comes from a violent home or a kid doesn't have breakfast before coming into school, right. if violence is the... The normal state of affairs in that child's life, I guess we can't be shocked that they're going to act out when they come to school, right? I think when a, there's a violent incident, a young person is communicating something. Something is not working for them, right? So I think the question is, what is it that's not working for them? And how do we ensure that we uh, have environments in schools that are conducive to learning. Um, and I think a part of it was uh, the other guests had mentioned, you know, the underfunding of schools in terms of the resources that are available to them. Um, and ensuring that, again, that we have healthy communities where the students have everything they need um, to be successful in school, right? So, because, you know, when they bring themselves into the classroom, they bring their whole self. So all the experiences that they have outside the school, um, the ways that they're living day to day, that manifests itself in school in the way that they might be able to learn or may have challenges learning as well. Eitan, I presume secondary school teachers in this province are trained what to do if a student, as was the case with Wendy, sticks a fist in their face and says, I'm going to kill you. Are there any circumstances in which their training allows them to punch back? Uh, absolutely not. I, I think, you know, the, the extent to which teachers are trained to deal with those situations, uh, I think, is maybe exaggerated. I think there, there is some training provided uh, by school boards, uh, and there's a lot of resources available to teachers. But when that moment comes, uh, it's a completely different feeling. Uh, I, you know, very similar to the story that Wendy shared. You know, I, I have been in that exact situation with the student very close to you and threatening you. And, you know, while you have some experience in some module that you received, 
that's a very different feeling. And how you respond to that is very personal and individual. And I think we hold teachers to a very high standard in how we expect them to respond uh, by de-escalating, uh, making the right choice, walking away. Uh, and I mean, to Anna's point, I think you know there's such an underreporting of these kind of violent incidents that are occurring every day that we don't have a really clear picture of everything that's going on. And we need that reporting and we need that information so we can have a much better idea of what are those target spots we need to address. Let me raise a complicated issue here, and Anna, I'll go to you first. Cops in schools, would you prefer that? I think that before we can make any sort of decision like that, we need to consult with the parents. I mean, the parents have been left out of the conversation. The report that you mentioned was called the Collaborative Approach to School, Safe School and Community Safety. Hmm. Who was collaborated? The parents weren't collaborated with. We weren't even invited to the meeting. So, well, you're on a parent council. Hmm. You weren't part of this? No. Nope. I, well, I invited myself. I, <laughs> I delegated at the meeting. I made a presentation because I found out about it. Um, and I went, but I wasn't invited to collaborate on the report. Hmm. I would have loved to. We have, you know, what? probably 500,000 parents. I mean, that's a lot of resources that we're not tapping into. Okay, let me do the background here, which is that once upon a time in the city of Toronto, anyway, there, there were po some police in some schools because uh, it was felt that they were needed there in order to bring down the violence that they were seeing. You will also not be surprised to hear that there were some parents who were thinking these cops are targeting minority kids and, they're, and, and therefore another decision was made to get the cops out of the schools, you know, for that and other reasons as well. Uh, okay, let's get into this. Chris, do we need him back in school? Police? Yeah. No, I don't think police have any place in our schools. Absolutely. Um, I don't think police are the way to respond to a social problem. I think other guests, uh, panelists have spoken about the fact that what we're seeing here is an acting out of unmet needs. And so we need to address that. We need more resources. We need more um, 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 more support. We need more EAs. We need more teachers. We need more assessments. Uh, we do not need more cops. Um, police end up, I mean, th this is, is not a big shocker. We know who what's going to happen if you bring police into, into schools and who's going to get targeted. No, no cops in schools, in my Al opinion. Although, interestingly enough, Tess Fai, you heard the interview with Tia before I came over here. She's a young black student. She said, it's time for cops back in schools. What do you think of that idea? I mean, you're going to get different perspectives uh, in any community, right? There's going to be a diversity of perspectives. Uh, and so, then, I mean, that's what she believes. But I will say from my own experience, working in a school where we had a police resource, a school resource officer for many years, um, what happens with an incident in a school, that doesn't happen in every school that uh, across the board, is the ones that have police officers, the behavior that might be looked at as inappropriate, uh, juvenile, unacceptable behavior in one school that doesn't have a cop, and then a school that has a cop becomes criminalized, right? Mm -hmm. So the young person is not only suspended, potentially expelled, but then they're going to also have to go through the criminal justice system, right? And that is happening disproportionately to black kids, uh, racialized folks, uh, racialized young people. And so that has not worked in terms of uh, stopping the violence uh, in schools. It's also, it, what it's done is exacerbated issues that we see in schools where students are being pushed out uh, and, and pushed, uh, pushed out of the education system. Although Vancouver has decided to bring police back into schools. Mm -hmm. Can you understand that decision? I don't see uh, police officers in schools as, as a way to keep students safe. Uh, police many uh, oftentimes are dealing with situations after they arise, right? So it's not a preventative measure. I think we need to look at all the things that uh, guests have mentioned in terms of what is a way that we can prevent violence in the first place and address the root causes of violence. Um, and if we look at all the reports from the, uh, the Roots of Youth Violence, doesn't mention police in schools. To the uh, the Faulkner report after the, the, the death of Jordan Manor in, in 2007, does not mention police in schools. So that's not a part of the solution. Okay. Eitan, how have we reached the point where apparently some kids think it's okay to bring a gun into a school? Oh, uh, that's a difficult question. I think, I think the idea that it's one specific root cause or one specific problem, uh, you know, tries to simplify something that's very complex. I think there are things going on in communities throughout Ontario that are causing students to not feel that their school is a safe place, is a community place to go. And as soon as you create that detachment, uh, then the idea that it's acceptable to bring violence into a school becomes something that students get comfortable with. If you encourage them to see school as a safe space, 
as a place where they are welcome, as a place where they are going to learn. The idea that you would even bring a weapon to school wouldn't even cross somebody's mind because that wouldn't be an appropriate place to bring that kind of instrument. All right, in which case, Chris, what about metal detectors in schools or in some schools? Do you like that idea? Yeah, I think we're, we're having the wrong conversation. I think, uh, you know, just to completely echo what the other panelists said is we need, we need proactive, not reactive. Um, so, no, I think we need to really address the root causes and metal detectors are not going to do that either. So for you, it's more resources. It's more money. It's more EAs. It's more teachers. It's all of that. Yeah, it's, it's looking at the root causes and addressing why kids are acting out. And I think we have to be careful with the language because often when we're talking about violence. You know, we're not talking about intention, intent to hurt. We're talking about kids who are running out of words, who are acting out, who are are not having their needs met. And so, so even the language of violence, which I use, um, we have to understand that that doesn't mean that kids are violent and therefore we need some kind of a punitive response. And Anna, based on your experience here, how's that um, sound? I, I would have to disagree with that because I think stabbing um, another, you know, child is a violence. I think that it was intentional. Um, it wasn't just, it, it, you know, they knew who they were going after. I mean, the kids were hearing rumblings of this all day. I think I agree that they need to step back and figure out why this is all happening. And there's a lot um, of stress behavior, not necessarily bad behavior, but this is the next point. This is violence. More or, than acting out. You know, more than saying. acting out. And I fully agree with that. I, you know, I just spoke to another parent about self-regulation and offered a book that I had read, but this is, this is violence. You know, this, they're, they're stabbing each other. Um, th there is a lot of causes, but I think, you know, it's very complex, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, but also so um, what is the school doing? Do we not have, you know, the safety training? You know, I, I'm really tired of the Toronto Justice School Board saying that it's a lack of resources. How about you tell us what you're doing with what you do have? Hmm. You know, why aren't our cameras fixed? Why don't we have safety audits? Um, do we have training? Do we have threat assessment? The kids knew this was happening. Where's a place for the kids to feel comfortable to come talk and not feel like snitches? You know, that this is going to happen at 3.15 after school in this hallway. Right. Right. Just for the record, we asked a Toronto District School Board representative to join us for this conversation. You will notice there's nobody here. Not they surprised. said somebody was unavailable. So, I mean, listen, we're delighted you're all here, but we wish somebody had been made available as well. As you, as you think about this, though, and the ideas we've heard for long-range solutions sound like great ideas, uh, but that doesn't necessarily help you tomorrow. What are we going to do tomorrow to make sure when your kids go to school, you don't worry about them leaving the house in the morning? Well, many parents that I spoke to, many parents of um, black children have said, they're like, we don't want the police. We face racism every day, but this is a crisis. You know, we want our kids to come home alive. You know, so maybe we need them right now. That is what a lot of the parents that I've been talking to have said. Okay, Tesfai, I know you're not a fan of cops in schools, mm -hmm. but how about as a short-term interim solution? I think the conversation that the board has been in terms of dealing with an immediate threat mm -hmm. Um, they may be, uh, they might be coming into schools, but it's not, it doesn't address the root causes. I think, like we said, I think that's what we really need to get to. Um, having someone that's permanently stationed in a school with, uh, with a gun um, doesn't do anything for school violence. Hmm. Wendy, would you have liked to have seen police in your schools when you were teaching and facing the kind of threats that you were? No. Um, it doesn't uh, address the root cause of the needs not being met. We had a program where we had a child and youth worker, a trial program, child and worth youth worker um, stationed at every, um, every school. And that person was responsible for handling de-escalation of um, our high flyers, if you want to call them that did programming and set up different groups. So that would, that produced a therapy um, safe spot. Um, this CYW also came in and did uh, self-regulation programs in each classroom. That was a year where we saw decreased violence because we had somebody that was dedicated to that. Administration likes to um, sweep it under the rug. Um, they normalize the filing of violent incident reports. Um, they politicize it to the point where, in my opinion, I think they should be shouting from the rooftops that, hey, we have a crisis here and we need to 
everybody needs to know how many violent incidents instead of trying to bury it. Okay, to that um, end then, let me go to Chris and ask, Chris, if a child comes to school scared for his or her safety, are they able to learn? Absolutely not. I mean, and, and, and teachers are, are, the teachers we spoke with in the research were incredibly distressed and spoke about kids who were so preoccupied. And you have to realize too that violence in schools and my research was on elementary schools. So, so this may change the conversation a bit, but you know, evacuations are routine. We had teachers who had, you know, a bin by the door so that if they had to evacuate the classroom, they could grab that bin and then they would go on what they called a library walk or um, a nature walk to try to get, they had to get the kids out. Well, if your day is being disrupted by, you know, exiting the classroom, going on this nature walk and then debriefing afterwards, that's a whole lot of learning that's not going on in addition to the trauma of that experience. So so absolutely not. And and, and I know the educators I spoke to are, are totally distressed about this. Hmm. Eitan, does it go without saying that uh, secondary schools are more violent places than elementary schools? Or should we not necessarily make that leap? I, I think we're talking about very different environments and so very different usage of the word violence and what that means. I think. Uh, I would say that in secondary schools, we have a bigger problem of underreporting uh, of violence than we do in elementary schools. I think that's a cultural component. Um, and, and I think, you know, to Chris's point, I think teachers' mental health is a huge challenge when we introduce workplace violence. I think something that I experience every day are calls and emails and connecting with my members who are experiencing mental health challenges as a result of different types of violence that they experience, especially violence in the form of threats and harassment. And that's becoming more and more pervasive mm -hmm. as students kind of understand sort of the boundaries of, well, if I do physical violence, kind of the consequences can often be more serious. Whereas if it's a threat or verbal harassment, you know, it, it kind of gets pushed aside or not as taken as seriously. Right. Speaking of boundaries, we've hit the boundary of our time. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming in and sharing your views on what is a really tough subject. Uh, Chris Bruckert, Wendy Goodis, Goods, excuse me, Wendy Goods, Tesfai Mangesha, Anna Sideropoulos, Eitan Laufer. Uh, it's really good of all of you to spend so much time with us here on TVO tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that is the agenda for Thursday, December 15th, 2022. Tomorrow, we'll explore how tougher economic times influenced gift giving and holiday traditions. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.